When, uh, when Bo passed away, I don't know how many of you know this, he was uh, working on, a, on another book about his life, uh, one that is going to be even uh, more inclusive than the original one that, that he did along with Mitch Album some years back. He was collaborating with a man who has a true ear for great stories and who's here to share a part of that book with all of us tonight, a great writer, a great friend of mine, and most especially to Bo Schembechler, John U. Bacon. I promise to be the shortest speaker here tonight. Jamie's not talking. <laughs> Paul, that's my line, damn it, you're stepping all over. <laughs> and not for the first time either. Probably not the last. Hope you all enjoy the night's dinner of a big baked potato, nice fried onion rings, and a big juicy steak brought to you by the Michigan Cardiac Center. <laughs> We're here for you, doctor. <laughs> the man knows how to market, give him his due. I'm pleased to report it's only downhill to the cars out of the, out of the lot here. We're all okay, I think. I recall uh, I've heard, I've interviewed over 100 of you guys, these former players and coaches. Uh, they tell great stories. A lot of the stories you heard tonight will be in the book, thank God. Um, and you hear how tough Bo was. You know, how tough he could be to the players, the coaches, and so on. It's all true, no question about it. But let me just say this, you guys had it easy. And here's why. He needed you guys. <laughs> he loved you guys. I am a sports writer. He did not need me. He did not necessarily love me. If he loved me, he kept it to himself. I'm sure of that. Frank, as a member of the media, please back me up on this. And so as a result, I was very taken and flattered when he decided to write the book with me uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. As soon as, uh, shortly after Don Cannon passed away, he called me in and said, it's time. We've been talking about it for six or seven years. It's time to do it. So I always made sure that I had my homework done before I got there. I'd read the books. I'd interviewed the guys here in this room. I had my questions all lined up. I knew my facts. I made sure I dropped them when I needed to, and at one point we're talking about the great offensive line at Ohio State under Woody Hayes, which Bo coached, which was not offsides the entire season because they went on the third count every single play. <laughs> Showing once again his flair for innovation. <laughs> hut, hut, hike. <laughs> and again. And I said, oh yeah, that was the 1960 national championship team. And he gave me a look that every player here will recognize. And it looks like this. <laughs> and he stared at me for what I think was about three weeks as I grew shorter, even shorter in my chair, tried to melt and get smaller and maybe he's looking at somebody else possibly. And finally he says, you know, Bacon, there are times I think you're not as stupid as I did when I first met you. But then you say some jackass comment like that, and I think, no, no, I was right the first time. Which always goes to show you trust your instincts. <laughs> and as I pulled a little tear from my eye, <laughs> what I could not conceal, the slight grin out of my face, because I realized, hey man, I'm in the club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a face mask, I can't block kicks. I'm not even Demo, but I'm in the club. Bo has insulted me personally. And that felt pretty good. Two stories from the book. One about his dad. Shemi, of course, told that at Memorial. We all know that story uh, by now. And I'll make that one brief, and that is that his dad was trying out to be the fire chief of Barberton, Ohio Fire Department, a job he longed for. Uh, the guy going against him for the position had been handed the answers to the civil service exam, which was obviously essential to get the job. Bo's friends knew this. I'm sorry, his dad's friends knew this, and gave him the same cheat sheet. And of course, that created a moral dilemma for his dad who ended up crying at home and hanging up the phone and telling them he simply could not do that. He did not do that. He got a 96 in the exam. The other guy got the job and he said, I'll never work for you and he didn't. You know that story. As I was packing up to go, we finished that story and I said, oh yeah, one more question. And that's when he says, you know, Bacon, that's your problem. There's always one more goddamn question. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> By now I'm a seasoned veteran. And my chest has been tenderized by Bo going like this for about a year and a half, so. I knew what to do. And I said, well, here's the question anyway. I said, you must have had a moral dilemma like that at some point during your career. At some point in your life, it's the same way your dad did. You must have had some sort of crisis of confidence, of conscience. And I want you to think about that in the next week. And when we meet next Tuesday, I want to hear the story. So I come back a week later. I set up my computer, my tape recorder, all this stuff. 
And I said, well, he says, you know, Bacon, I actually thought about your damn question. And then he said, and you know what? And here's the honest to God's truth. I could not think of a single moral dilemma that we had here, and I'll tell you why. Because we always knew what the right thing to do was, so we did it, and we slept well at night. Bam. If you want, in a nutshell, what integrity looks like, that's it. Tell me honestly how many things we face every day where we do not know in our heart of hearts what the right thing to do is. And Bo always knew, a true North Compass every single time. So he did it, and he slept well at night. And that is integrity in a nutshell.